people that are homeless in this really cold weather because this year I think it's going to be colder than normal. It already is. I don't think it's usually this cold around this time, right? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. It's, I'd be tripping out. I walk outside. I go back in. Charlie, I'm good. <laughs> but turning your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 7. As you're turning there, I want to give out the invitation once again. It's this Thursday, Thanksgiving. We are having a little Thanksgiving bash here. Um, for anybody that wants to just come, or if you don't have anywhere to go, if you know someone that doesn't have somewhere to go, you don't have to come here to join us. You're welcome. Somebody can just walk in and join us. We're, you know, you're more than welcome to invite somebody. Um, we want to share Thanksgiving with you, my family and our church family. We want to just be a family. So, you know, we have a bunch of people bringing stuff. There's going to be a ton of food, probably more food than is going to get eaten. So if there's anybody that wants to join, join. If you don't want to join, don't join. It's fine. Don't feel obligated, but you can. It'll be from 2 to 5 here at the church. We're going to remove all the chairs, set up a bunch of tables, kind of like we did for the Halloween thing. I'm going to have a big old bash, except since we're not outreaching to the world. This is just for the body and whoever wants to join us, I suppose. But so... Well, that's that, you guys. There's the invite. If you don't come, that's fine. If you do come, we're excited to see you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for being our God, and we thank you for your goodness and for your mercy. We thank you for your grace, for your faithfulness. We thank you that you are the everlasting King of kings, Lord of lords, the true God of heaven and earth, Lord. There is none like you. We just exalt your name. And we ask, Lord, that you would grace us with your Holy Spirit, with your presence, that you would remove me from myself, get me out of your way, get me out of my way. Would you be the teacher here this morning, Lord? Would you be the power in this house? Would your word go forth and do the work that you've sent him forward to do? Would he cut away the things in us, Lord, that should not be there? And Lord, would you fill us with what it is you have for us? Would you teach us, Lord, to die to ourselves, that we would live to you. Teach us to walk in spirit, that we would walk in truth. We pray, Father, that as we get into this text today, that you would help us to draw close to you, to love you and to serve you with the knowledge that we've been given in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Most of us are familiar with Brittany Griner, yes? She's the WNBA, that girl who was in Russia, got caught with weed and... She's doing, I think, a 10-year stint now is what it is, is what I read. It's the last thing I read. She's ten, I see the smirks. 10 years for some weed. <laughs> but that is important, and I mention this for a purpose. Because when she was in the States, it wasn't an issue. As a matter of fact, weed has become so much of not an issue. I mean, it's, I think it's an issue. But as far as politically is that anybody can have it, and there is no... Well, it's probably age restrictions, but it's, it's legal across the board. It's, there's no license required any longer. So when you come under the jurisdiction of the United States of America, it's permissible. Once you cross the threshold into another jurisdiction, rules change. And rules change for her. And she thought that because she was privileged, because she was an American, all the things that they protest, that her privilege was somehow going to cross over and overdo that jurisdiction. And Russia said no. We have our laws. And if you're not going to obey our laws, then you're going to suffer the penalty of our laws. Hence, she's doing a 10-year stint. I say that for a reason. Because today we're going to see the jurisdictions that are in play in the life of the Christian. We have two jurisdictions. The jurisdiction of flesh and the jurisdiction of spirit. The jurisdiction of law and the jurisdiction of grace. And Paul is going to make the point very clear today, depending on which jurisdiction you're in, there are certain penalties or benefits that are attributed to you because of that. Kind of like Brittany, she, wrong jurisdiction, she got hit with the penalties. Well, if we find ourselves in the wrong jurisdiction as Christians, we get hit with the penalties also. If we're not going to back up, but if we were to back up, we remember that chapter 6 ended with Paul saying, for the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And it's very simple, the point that he made throughout chapter 6. We are all slaves. Every last one of us are slaves. So we have babies, you guys, and when they cry, we just love them. I can't stress that enough. Let the babies cry. We got big speakers to so listen through the cry. But... The jurisdiction of, of, of law, the jurisdiction of grace, and we go back to last week and we see that we're all under a jurisdiction. We're all under a dominion. We are all slaves to one or the other. Either we're slaves to sin and death through the law or we're slaves to God through grace. 
but nobody gets to part from it and choose their own path as far as, well, I'm going to be a third party. Ah, there is no third party. In this case, you're either grace or your law. We call them Republicans or Democrats today. I'll let you guess which is which. <laughs> but, you know, you're either grace or your law, but there is no other way. And you're a slave to one of them. And it's not by choice. You are by default a slave to law. We are born into sin. We are born under the law. Now we get to choose, however, to be a slave to grace. That we get to choose. And we saw that last week, so I'm not going to stress it. because I mention that because when we get into the text today, he starts off by saying, Or do you not know, brethren, for I'm speaking to those who know the law. He starts off with that, those who know the law. That's been his big spiel, I mean, for the last like three chapters. He's been covering sin and law and how the two are intertwined. He says... Do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who know the law. These are the brothers of the faith. Today we call them Christians. He's talking to the believer. But he's talking to a particular type of believer. Today we would call them Messianic Jews. He's talking to the Jews of the faith. And he's telling them, do you not know, brethren? I'm speaking to those who know the law. Now, he says this for a purpose. Because when we look at the life of Paul, he was the apostle of grace, right? He is the apostle who went to the Gentiles in spite of the Judaistic traditions. The, the idea of the traditions that the Jews were superior to the Gentile, the, the, in, in face of the traditions that the Gentiles were nothing but burning blocks for hell. Paul goes then to the Gentiles because that's where God sent him. And in doing so, the Jews, first of all, had an issue with that because he went to the Gentiles. And then to add further insult to injury, he's teaching this anti-law gospel. And it almost would appear that Paul is degrading the law of God. And many Jews took issue with Paul for this reason. This is who he's talking to. So you know who I'm talking about, so we can be a little more particular. Normally we don't turn much, but we're going to make a couple turns today. And the first turn is going to be one book back to Acts chapter 15. Because I want you to see how this takes place. Paul and Barnabas went down to Antioch. That's one of the you know, main places that they did their ministry. It's where Christians were first called Christians down in Antioch. Yeah, it was Antioch. And I needed Ramon's approval for that one. I was like, yeah, no. sometimes you need that back up there. But it, this was one of the headquarters of uh, Paul and Barnabas's ministry. They go down to Antioch and they're relating all the good works that are being done and they're continuing the good work and they get in the crossfires of some of the Judaizers, some of the guys who are Christians but they want them to be under law also, which isn't the proper term for Judaizer but I used it like that. But I'm going to just read verses 1 through 12 so you guys can see the issue that Paul's been dealing with with many of these Jews. Now he's going to be dealing here with particularly Pharisees. These are those who held to the highest standards of the law and so to speak in their flesh kept the law to the best of their ability, which turns out we're going to see later was Jack Squat. But in verse 1 of chapter 15 of Acts, some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go to, up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning the issue. Therefore, being sent on their way by the church, they were passing through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and they were bringing great joy to all the brethren. When they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed stood up saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, and by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, testifies to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are. All the people kept silent and they were listening to Barnabas and Paul as they were relating what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. So Paul has been having to deal with these, these Christians. They believe. I mean, and it's not... 
far-fetched to think that many of the religious leaders did come to the faith because these guys were experts in the law. They studied the law of God. They knew the word of God. They knew the signs to look for. And yes, though, while it was in their face, they missed it. You know how it is, right? You ever looked at something and you're trying to figure something out and you just can't? So you take a break. Go rest. Go sleep. Come back the next day and look at it with a new, fresh set of eyes and then oftentimes you'll find exactly whatever issue you might be looking for well that's in essence what happened with these religious leaders when it was all said and done they look back with fresh eyes and were like uh oh we killed the messiah and many of them became believers many of the priests became believers if you were to read early church history many of the religious leaders that crucified maybe not all that crucified him but many that were a part of those riots and dissensions ended up becoming believers Saul of Tarsus being one of them and as Paul is going about and he's teaching he's giving this gospel that's void of law and we've been studying that for the last several chapters that the law and the grace of God are separate entities and they do not work together. It would be like one's a brake and one's the gas. If you ride them both, you're gonna just brake your car, it doesn't work. You can either ride the brake and press the brake or you can ride the gas and press the gas. But you can't do both, well you can do both, but like I said, it's to your detriment, you know, but. And he's been at this for a minute. And these Judaizers or these Jews who are Christians now, they don't care for what Paul is saying. They don't like the fact that he's talking about the law of God in a way that almost seems degrading. It almost seems insulting to the law of God because these Jews held the law of God to the highest of standards. Now, we're going to find here that God's law serves a purpose and it serves the highest purpose. As a matter of fact, in the first service, I forgot to turn here so you guys get something they didn't. I do a service for the guys who teach in the back so that they can get fed. But we're going to now turn to Galatians chapter 3 because we're going to see the purpose of the law because the law really is important. The law is superior. The law is God's word. And when we're dealing with God's word, that is a really, you know, that's a, that's a big weight to put on the shoulders, to so to say, so to speak. Um, turn to Galatians chapter 3 verse 21 through 26. Listen to the purpose of the law. The law has a purpose and Paul understood this purpose. As a matter of fact, it's Paul who wrote this. But Paul isn't degrading the law. Paul isn't making the law unnecessary. On the contrary, he says the law is very necessary. We need the law, but we're not to live in the law. Listen to what chapter 3, verse 21 through 26 says. Is the law then contrary to the promise of God? May it never be. There's that strong negative. We've seen a bunch of those in Romans. Never. For if the law had been given, which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. But the scripture has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith, which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So what is the purpose of the law? To be a tutor, a direction post. And what does that direction post do? Where does it send you? It sends you to Jesus. That is the purpose of the law. It is a tutor that leads us to Christ. And here's the kicker. When we come to Christ, the law is no longer necessary. That is the purpose of the law. It's like the train, right? You know that train that goes back and forth to and from Santa Fe? If you're going to Santa Fe and you get on the train, once you get to Santa Fe, do you stay on the train? Well, if you want to pass Santa Fe, but if your goal is to get to Santa Fe, you get off the train. You no longer need the train. You reached your destination. Now, you might need the train if you're going to come back, which we do that when we make our trip back into our flesh. Yeah, you know, we backtrack, but ultimately the law takes us to the Lord. And once we've reached the Lord, it's no longer necessary. Now, again, I know that sounds almost heretical, but it's not. And we're going to see Paul's going to delve into it quite beautifully today. So back to chapter 7 of Romans. I'm going to reread the beginning of verse 1. Or do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives? The law has jurisdiction as long as he lives. So, so long as one is alive jurisdiction reigns and rules in the life of that living being. Now this word jurisdiction in the Greek is uh, kureu, 
Now, it sounds very familiar, or it should, at least if you've been with us for any length of time, because there's a word that we've mentioned several times called kirios or kirios. Kireyu is of that same root, and it literally means to be lord, to be master, to be ruler, to have dominion. Kureyu, that's what jurisdiction means, to have dominion, to have reign, to have rule. When you're in a jurisdiction, you have the authority or the rule to implement however you see fit. As an officer of the law, if, if you know, say somebody, a, a cop, well, I guess if you're in a cop chase, that's different, <laughs> you know, but let's say there's an Albuquerque police officer down in Belen, and I'm speeding along. Now, he can flash his lights at me, and he can technically pull me over. Is Belen in Berlin? Oh, the sheriff's are Berlin, Bernalillo. Albuquerque's Albuquerque. So he can, he can probably flash his lights, pull me over, detain me till an actual Belen officer comes, but he himself is out of jurisdiction. He can't really... I mean, I can run, but you know, then again, you're still running from the cops. A bad idea. Don't don't be doing that. But he is out of jurisdiction. He doesn't have the authority to implement the law there. Now, coming to Albuquerque, that same APD officer has the jurisdiction and the authority to do so. It's like with law. When people are you know super duper felons and they want to get away from the jurisdiction of the United States, they 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 head to lands where there's no jurisdiction. That means that the U.S. has no lawful means of detaining them and bringing them back out of jurisdiction they're out of dominion they're out of rule that is this word here so he says did you not know that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives now he's going to give this marital example in verses two and three and it's a very straightforward example it's not going to take a whole lot of dissecting to understand what he's saying because it's just it's, it's a very straightforward listen to what he says he says for the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living but if her husband dies she is released from the law concerning the husband so then if while her husband is living she is joined to another man. She shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Now, this isn't an analogy. This isn't an allegory. This is a straight example, a literal example of how the jurisdiction of the law works. When people get married, we don't. I know we don't think about this in, in our country, but here's the truth. If you're married... You belong to your spouse. Uh-uh, no, he didn't. Yes, I did. Because legally, you belong to your spouse. Vice versa, your spouse belongs to you. You guys sign a contract that is supposed to be until death do us part. And as the Bible would say, you are no longer your own. You belong to your spouse. Your, your spouse belongs to you. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, speaking of you know sex and whatnot, that if, if married people you know, want to fast for a season and or for a moment and, you know, to get, you know, whatever cleared up with God, do so. But don't hold off for too long. And if your husband wants your body, you give it to him. And it doesn't mention about the girl because, you know, let's be real, guys are the ones that are really going for it more than girls. But yeah, maybe not, I don't know, maybe some girls are crazy. But <laughs> it's all right, nothing wrong with being a little crazy if you're married. But... But Paul makes the point that your body isn't yours. If your spouse needs your body, you hand it over because it's theirs. Vice versa, you know, if your spouse, the other spouse needs the body, hand it over. It's not yours. Well, I'm not in the mood. Get yourself in the mood. <laughs> you know, figure it out. I mean, spouses, there's ways to get your spouse in the mood. So just, just so you know, you, you don't have to force it. You, you be kind to your spouse and get her or him in the mood. I know guys aren't in the mood sometimes too. Never saw that coming when I was single. <laughs> it's true, though. But he makes this very straightforward shot. Women, if you are married and your husband dies, you're free to remarry. That's what it means to be joined. To get, it's more of a sexual joining. It's the, but, I mean, that's the idea in marriage. When you get married, you have sex. That's that unifying as one, that one fleshness. And so if you're married and your husband dies, you're free. Go find another husband. You're good. You're in the good. But if your husband is alive, let's say you've divorced now, and your husband is alive and you join to another man, she shall be called an adulteress, he says. Now, what we're going to talk about that in a little bit it has nothing to do with the text, but just because of the temperature of our culture, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. But his point is the jurisdiction ended when the spouse died because that's when the contract, the contract is under the law. When they die, they are no longer under law. They are now freed. It's, been, it's fulfilled. The contract has been fulfilled. They're now freed to be with whomever they wish. 
But so long as that spouse is alive, you are still under the contract or under the law. And therefore, you are bound by that law. Now I'm going to read verses 4 and 5 right away, and then we're going to go back and talk a little bit about this. Verse 4, Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. He says we were to die to the law through the body of Christ. We were made to die to the law. The law was never meant to give and impart life. The law actually brought death. The day that the law was given on Mount Sinai, 3,000 people of the congregation of Israel fell. And the day that the Spirit of God was given on Pentecost, 3,000 people were recorded as being saved. So you see a stark contrast and difference there. The law imparts death. Grace brings life. But we were made to die to the law and to be joined to another. For what purpose? For the purpose that we might bear fruit. Did you know that part of your purpose as a believer isn't just to go to church and isn't just to worship God and lift your hands and sing. It's to bear fruit for God. Look at what he says here in verse 4. So that you might be joined to another, that would be Christ, to him who is raised from the dead, again Christ, in order that we might bear fruit for God. Now again, I'm sorry for the turns, but you know we often don't turn at all, but today we're turning. Go one book to the right, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Because Paul says something in chapter 15 here, we're going to read verses 35 to 37. Paul says something here that is very applicable. Now, Paul's talking in, in, in Corinthians here, he's talking about physical resurrection. He's talking about a physical body that will be resurrected to new life. We are talking about spiritual resurrection in Romans. So there is that difference. I want you to be aware of that. But the principle applies, which is why I'm coming here. So in verse 35, he says, But someone will say, how are the dead raised, and with what kind of body do they come? You fool. That which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or of something else. So he's saying when, it, when, when a seed dies, it's planted. And when it comes up, it brings forth fruit. It, bears, it brings a tree that brings forth fruit. He's, in this case, he uses wheat, which isn't fruit, but I don't know what you call wheat. Uh, grain? Grain. We'll, we'll call it fruit, though. We'll just pretend it's an apple seed <laughs> or a peach seed. I like peaches. And that's the idea. So we were made to die to the law so that we can come back to life in Christ and bear fruit. Like this seed mentioned here in 15. Again, he's talking about physical re resurrection. But the spiritual application sticks. So realize when you came to Christ, you're dying to yourself. You're coming to the end of you. wasn't just so that you can be freed. That's one of the things we hear often, right? Because even the Bible says we were set free for the sake of freedom. The truth is the Christian was set free for the sake of slavery, right? Nobody is truly free in here. None of us. We are all slaves to one thing or another because by nature, by default, we subjugate ourselves to something. Not me. I'm just a boss chur I'm a boss chick and I do it my way. Then you're a slave to yourself. That's called humanism. That's the fastest growing religion in the world today. You're a slave to, to, to the world, to the flesh, to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. You're still a slave. You're just blinded and deceived and so stupid that you can't see it. That's messed up. Sorry if that's you. <laughs> yeah, but but let, let the truth be what it is. We are slaves. Some people are slaves to their children, right? They worship their kids, and their kids are their world. I get it. Stupid move, but I get it. You know, I have two stepkids and I love them, but I didn't know how much you could love a kid until I had my son. And I was like, whoa, something changed in me. I was like, I mean, he gives my wife a run for her money. Like, I didn't know I could love, I mean, I, I just knew I loved Jesus more than my wife, and that stands, baby. You know, it's true. She's watching online. And, you know, um, but another person more than her, I was like, never. It's not, it never could happen. And then my son was born, and I was like, oh, man. <laughs> Woo! If I had to pick between you and him, that would be messed up. I'd have to just die for you both, you know? <laughs> like, one of them had to die, I'd have to take the hit because I couldn't, I mean, I didn't know you could love another person that much. I was like, wow. So 
So I get when people worship their kids, but it's faulty and stupid. It's fleeting and it's failing because then your kids grow up. Have you ever noticed that the people who worship their kids, when their kids move out, their marriage usually ends up in divorce? Because they've spent their entire life circling these kids. And they spend 18, 20, however long, it's all about the kids, it's all about the kids. And then the kids grow up and get their own lives because they ain't trying to stay home forever. And then now the mom and dad, for over 18 years, they've, they've focused on nothing but kids. They don't even know each other that well anymore. And now it's like living with a stranger. And that's where the irreconcilable differences come from. We're going to talk about those in a moment here. Garbage. I'm here to let you know, irreconcilable difference is a short term for I gave up. That's what it means. Well, I'll tell you why in a moment here. But we are born again to be slaves to God. We are born again so that we could bear fruit for the kingdom of God. And when we operate in that aspect, you guys, we operate in the fullness of the spirit of God. We operate in how we were meant to operate. Humanity was not meant to operate on its own. We were never meant to be completely self-sustaining, ever as a matter of fact, we're so unself-sustaining that God saw a man that he didn't have a counterpart and said it's not good for man to be alone. So we gave him a woman. Now, has anybody in here ever seen somebody with a struggling marriage? I have. And have you ever seen somebody in a struggling marriage and they decide the way we're going to fix our struggling marriage is we're going to have a baby? <laughs> That's the proper response. That is the stupidest thing you could do. And if you are already struggling in marriage... Adding another human being does not make that easier. It actually is going to complicate it significantly. And you're actually making your chances for your marriage to survive about tenfold worse. Bad move. Get your stuff together. Learn how to love your wife. Learn how to respect your husband. Then have a kid. That's a good environment to bring a kid into. But when you're struggling, you don't throw another person into it. So when God created man, he was alone and it wasn't good. So he gave him Eve. It was good, but it wasn't good enough. They still had a relationship with the living God. They weren't created just to live on their own and sustain themselves. They were created to walk in unity with God. That is why God has such a desire for humanity. Because that's part of our purpose is to, to be in union with him. That's why God has gone, gone to such great lengths to redeem us back to himself so that we can be brought into the family of God. If God didn't want unity with us, he would have just sent us off into oblivion. It would have been simple. That's not God's desire. We are uniquely created in his image, and he desires you and I. Your purpose as a Christian, one of them, if you've ever questioned it, bear fruit. I would ask the question of yourselves, of myself, how am I bearing fruit for the kingdom of God? And if I'm not, how can I start bearing fruit for the kingdom of God? And it starts really by listening to his spirit and obeying him, whatever that call might be. I'm here to tell you the call isn't always fun. I'm here to tell you planting a church isn't, it's exciting. It's not, it's tiring, man. It's exhausting. Oh my goodness, it's so exhausting. It is it just, it's, it's, it's constant going constant going it's constant going. and even when i get a break my mind doesn't shut off so i might get a physical rest but mentally like my brain is still the gears are going and going and it's like so then when i'm done with my break my, my mind starts to wind down and i got to get back to work physically it's like it's exhausting but it's filling i know i'm in the will of god because god re-energizes me when i do this i go home pooped at the same time though don't get me wrong but you want to know how you can bear fruit for the kingdom of god well, listen to what he's telling you and calling you to do. That's how you bear fruit to the kingdom of God. Don't go try to bear fruit on your own merits because you're going to bear rotten fruit. You're going to bear flesh. That's counterproductive. Now, that being said, I'll go back to verse 6 in a moment, but I'm going to say something because this has nothing to do with the text, but I think it's pertinent for our culture because we live in a culture where divorce is rampant and I'd imagine there's at least a handful of people in here that are divorced my wife is one of them and when we think about divorce it's scary because of what the Bible has to say about it again this has nothing to do with the text but because of the the, 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 the climate of our culture I want to address this he says here that if you if a woman leaves her husband and remarries or joins to another man, she's an adulteress. Jesus was a little more clear on this in Matthew chapter 5. He says if a woman divorces her husband and then remarries, 
she causes him and her to commit adultery. That's heavy, right? That kind of like screws everything up in our minds. Like, I almost didn't marry my wife because of that, because she's divorced. I'm like, well, I don't want her and I to be in adultery. If, Lord, I, I need to understand that something ain't right. Well, the thing is cultural context. In Jesus' day, there was a school known as Halal. He was a rabbi, and he was pre-Jesus, but it was the school of Halal. And that was thriving. It was a very liberal school. And in the school of Halal, they made the, the stature, basically. They made the, 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 the law or the tradition that if a woman is unclean to any degree, that's grounds for divorce. So it's like this. If you stub my toe and I feel like you were intentional about it, I could divorce you. If you burnt my toast making breakfast, that is defecting you and I can divorce you. That, that's the tradition of the school of Halal. It went as far as to say this, if a man saw another woman more beautiful than his wife, that's a defect in her and grounds for divorce. That's a good, that's a good reaction. It's ridiculous, right? Yeah. But that's how they thought. And, and people would get divorced for any little thing. That's why Jesus says, if you've divorced your spouse and remarried, you're committing adultery. Because many of the divorces that took place were not permissible divorces. Because he does go on to say there are grounds for divorce. And he says for sexual immorality. And the Greek word there is pornea. Now I got to do a deeper study on this. I was listening to a teaching not too long ago. And it turns out pornea is a little bit more complex than just sexual immorality. It even goes as far as to say, I believe, it deals with 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 emotional, like an emotional affair, emotion, an emotional cheating, so to speak. Like it's a, it's a very deep word. And there are many ways a person can be cheated on, so to speak. It's not just having a sexual intercourse relationship. That is primarily, I mean, that's an obvious. But I mean, there are grounds for divorce. Now, here's the kicker. Where does, where does law have jurisdiction? Over the living, right? That's what Paul said. When we come to Christ, what happens? You die. You die to you. We talked about it in Romans 5. You die, you identify with his death going under in the baptism. And when you come up, you identify with the new life in Christ. Therefore, and this has been his whole point, when you were in Christ, law no longer has jurisdiction over you. Okay? That, that's how I was able to marry my wife because I realized she's a new creation in Christ. She's been forgiven. The law is no longer over her. She is forgiven. Well, what if I was a Christian when I fell? Well, that means you just backtracked. Get back to Christ now. You're in Christ. Law has no jurisdiction over you. You're in grace now. Now, again, as Christians, these aren't licenses to sin because if you're truly in grace... Our goal is we don't want to sin. We want to please our master. We want to be pleasing to our Lord. So these aren't licenses. So again, this has nothing to do with the text, but because of the climate of our culture, and I'm sure there are some in here that have been divorced. If not, you know, good job. Hopefully, you know, still, there may be some online. And we just want to make sure that we understand what, what it means to divorce and to remarry and so forth. Because again, you know, I struggled with that when I married my wife, when we were engaged. And, you know, and a lot of people just don't know that. So I thought it was important to know. So hopefully you take something from that. Now, back to verse 6. He says something here really interesting. He says, But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were... I'm sorry, I'm going to go back to verse 5 because that's what I wanted to see. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body. Now notice that phraseology. He says, The flesh... And the sinful passions which were aroused by the law. That is a heavy statement. For the Jew, that would almost sound like sacrilege. That would almost be like a blasphemous statement. That almost sounds as if he says the law makes us sin. It's not what he's saying though. Verse 6, but now we have been released from the law. And I mentioned that because he's going to mention it here in verse 7 in a big way. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. And there it is. When we came to Christ, we were bound to the newness of the Spirit. We died to ourselves and we clung to Christ. We are now alive with Him in Spirit. We are now under the law or the jurisdiction of grace. No longer the law of sin and death. Verse 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Remember what we just read in verse 5? 
the sinful passions and desires that are aroused by the law. Again, the Jews, they probably would have missed verse 6 and you know, leading into verse 7, and all they heard is, what did you just say about God's law? That'd be like talking about your mama, your daddy. What did you say about my mama? You, know, you don't hear anything after whatever they just said about your mom because it's like, what did you just say? You want to get hit? Like, give me some knuckle sandwich right here, bro. Nah, <laughs> I'm not going to give anybody a knuckle sandwich. But you get the point. So Paul makes the emphasis here. He says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? The rhetorical question, no. He uses the strongest Greek negative, me ginotio. May it never be. Think of it like this. Never! An emphasis. Never. Is the law sin? The law is not sin. The law is the word of God. He says, on the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. The law does not produce sin. The law reveals sin. Sin takes its opportunity through the law, but it's not from the law itself. It's because of what the law does. And what does the law do? It acts as a mirror. And when you look into the perfect law of God, it reflects back on us. And what we see is our shortcomings. Remember what the law was in Galatians? The law was a tutor. Kind of like a mirror. It led us to a conclusion. So when you look in the mirror in the morning and you're all granuda, what do you do about yourself? You use what that mirror is telling you to fix yourself. You agree with the mirror that what you're seeing isn't good. Ay, que muchacho. I gotta fix this. I was looking in the mirror this morning and I had a unibrow and I didn't, I didn't realize it was there. I used to always keep this thing clean and I was like, man, how long has that been sitting on my face? Because <laughs> I mean, it was pretty ripe. I didn't even know about unibrows until I was in 10th grade. There was this uh, ninth grade. There was this one senior. She was, I, you know, she was always flirting with me, probably messing with me. And one day she's like, "Oh, you're so cute. If you just get rid of that unibrow." And I was like, "What?" It was unibrow. So I went home and I had this caterpillar on my head. And I was like, "I didn't even know you had a unibrow." So if you ever notice, my 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 gap hair is this big, because well, I didn't know what to. I was in ninth grade. I took a razor. I went. <laughs> And then it turns out you don't, that's not how you get rid of your unibrow. You're supposed to pluck it. But I didn't know that. You know, so now I got this gap between my eyes. And but I had a unibrow this morning. And you know who told me I had a unibrow? The mirror did. My wife didn't. Thanks, baby. Yeah. Somebody should have told me I had a unibrow because I, I want to look good too. As good as I can anyway, you know. But the mirror let me know what was going on with my face. That's what the law does to our soul, to our spiritual life. The law lets us know that our spiritual life is in defect. The law lets us know that we have fallen short. The law lets us know that we are not living up to the standard. That is the purpose of the law. It is a tutor. He says, I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. There's that mere effect. Verse 8, but sin taking opportunity through the commandment produced in me, coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead says, sin took the opportunity through the law. He says, sin, was ex a success ah, sin is successful through the commandment. I'm going to reread verse 8. But sin taking opportunity through the commandment produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. So sin takes opportunity through the law, through the command, and it produced in him coveting of every kind. So prior to him understanding what coveting was, he looked at the law and saw he was a coveter. And then every kind of covetousness was revealed within him. And the idea is like this. Sin is successful through the command because forbidden fruit tastes sweeter. And that's the truth. Adam and Eve in the garden, they had one prohibition. God gave them everything. Dominion over everything. One prohibition. One. Don't eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's it. They could touch it. I wouldn't, but they could. They could look at it. They might have even been able to lick it. I don't know. Don't eat it. That's it. And we don't know how long they were in the garden before they ate that fruit, but I'm going to imagine it wasn't long. Because as far as we know, they had not yet had sexual intercourse. For as far as we know, no kids were born at that point. So, I mean, it must have been pretty stinking quick. 
Like, you know, you drop, drop, God dropped him off in the garden and said, don't eat that tree. The first thing he did is walk over to the tree. Mm, food. <laughs> yeah, like, I mean, that's the appearance of what happened. I mean, I'm not saying that's how it happened, but it happened extremely fast. One prohibition. Why? Stolen waters always taste sweeter. Does anybody remember what it was like before you were married and some of us might still be single? How, you know, if there was somebody that you weren't really interested in and they showed a little interest in you, but you're like, meh, I'm good. And then they get over you and go on with their life and meet somebody else and get married. And then you see that they got married and now all of a sudden they look nice and desirable. Like, and you're like, I missed my shot. Dang. All of a sudden, what was not, not desirable now becomes desirable. Why? Because now you can't have it. I've been there many times. I mean, back before I was married, I'd be like, I was always looking for a wife, and the girls that were interested in me, I'm like, nah. And of course, the girls that I, you know, couldn't reach, or the ones I was always aiming for, and then some girl would get married that was once interested in me, and then I'd be like, wow, she was pretty. I messed up that one. Well, I guess I keep going forward, and but flicking myself in the noggin, because what an idiot. Why? Because the thing that we can't have always appears to be more desirable. That's how sin takes its opportunity through this. He says, apart from the law, sin is dead. In Romans 5.13, we remember Paul saying that where there is no law, sin is not imputed. So the law can't be applied if, again, if it's out of jurisdiction. It's the idea of a police officer pulling you over out of jurisdiction. They can detain you, but they can't charge you formally. They can't arrest you. They can't do anything. Can they arrest you? They can't arrest they can't. Can they pull you over? They can pull you over, though, and detain you, right? No, really, they can't. Okay, there you go. I mean, I wouldn't run still. Because <laughs> they still got, they, my, my dad's, my, my friend's dad used to always say, you can't outrun the radios. You know, and, you know, you can't outrun the radio, man. You can't. Unless you're a bad dude, you know. But I watched this one video of this guy outrunning a chopper. And his car was so fast that he was, he stayed ahead of the chopper till the chopper started running out of gas. That was incredible. I was like, dang. It was the only time I've ever seen somebody really get away. I, was, I, was, I think a white challenger. What's up? Till the other chopper. Till the other chopper comes. <laughs> yeah, you can't outrun the radio. Point, point well said. But apart from the law, sin is dead. Is that what, is that what I read last? Yeah, sin is dead. Verse 9. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. Now he said, I was once alive apart from the law. This can mean one of two things. One, as a child, he was ignorant of the law. Therefore, the law was not over him. It's like, you know, we talk about the age of accountability. When does the law of God, you know, become pertinent to a person? When does it then apply? Now I'm going to give you my opinion. Now my opinion, and it's based on biblical data, is that the age of 20, I believe, is the age of accountability. Now I don't know if it's, it ends at 20 or if it begins at 20. I don't know. I do know that in the wilderness wanderings when the Israelites were griping and complaining complaining against God, that God smote many of them and then said, you're all going to die, except for those 20 and under. So for whatever reason, he didn't hold them accountable. Now, Ian, you're 15. Do you ever complain? I got a 15-year-old too, so let's be honest. Yeah, 15-year-olds <laughs> complain. 15-year-olds have a mind of their own, right? They're, they're, they're pretty good at arguing, man. They can articulate some of them, some of their arguments, bro. And I'm going to give you some advice, man. I know you think you're smooth, but you're not as smooth as you think. My kids are funny, man. They try to, they try to outdo me, and I'm like, bro, I was better at, you, at this thing you when I was your age. Way better. Like, you suck. Stop. Stop trying. Like, bro, just, just be straight with me because you're not good at it anyway. And it's like, but the funny thing is, I thought I was smooth, and the truth is, I'm going to confess to you, Auntie. When I was a kid, we used to have BB guns and we'd go lizard hunting in the fields, right? I was walking home from Ramon's house and my auntie's car was parked way up by our house. And I was a good, like, 50 yards. I was far. But I just cocked my BB gun and I just pointed in there and I shot it. Boom! And I heard a <laughs> So I walked by. I didn't even look at her. I just didn't think anything of it. Well, I went inside and she, she left the house and about two minutes later, it came back crazy. Somebody shot my windshield. And I was like, what? It's a BB. How did you even see that in the nighttime? Well, my dad knew I did it. I denied it until last week. I don't think anybody knew. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, I mean, I denied that with everything in me. My dad whooped the living daylights out of me. He knew I did. I denied it till the end. How did he know? Well, I believe God gives dads a supernatural 
instinct, but he knew it was me. I did it. You know, I, I shot your windshield. And you know, I can't remember. A car, that was a windshield. Allah Modi. It was a BB. I was 10. <laughs> you know, my point is, is we're not as suave as we think we are. We think we're smooth, but we're not. So as kids, we're ignorant of the law. It's not, it doesn't, it's, we're not held accountable. We might think, well, they're 18. They're, in our culture, 18 is an adult. Even in the Jewish culture, at 13, you're an adult. Or 12, you're an adult. But let's be real. Scientifically, we know that males don't even fully develop to like 25. I <laughs> Shoot, man, I think I just developed like last year. I'm still developing, if you ask me. I'm still like a big old kid. You know, and, and so, but I personally believe the age of accountability is 20. That's, and that's based on what God standardized in the nation of Israel in the wilderness wanderings. If you got something better, shoot it. Go for it. I mean, anything else is pure conjecture. There's no, there's no real evidence on anything else. But I think that's a good standard to hold to. But, or the second is this, that you're blissfully living in sin and you're trying to obey God's law while you're not capable of fully obeying God's law. And that could also be what he's talking about. Again, listen to what he says here in verse 9. I was once alive apart from the law. Why? Because he thought he was keeping the law. Right? Paul, in his own words, mentioned that he was a Pharisee, a Pharisees of the highest order, and he kept the law to the T. So he says of himself. And I'm paraphrasing for him, but... So in his, in his mind, alive to the fullest degree. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. The commandment that resulted in life, that was supposed to result in life, truly ended up being death. So we're not going to turn there, but if you were to go to John 5, 39, the Jews thought that the law gave life. Jesus told them this, speaking to the Pharisees, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. But, the, but I... I'm going to read this. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. The, the, the religious leaders thought that if you just attain the word of God and hold it and keep it, you'll have life eternal. So they searched the scriptures and they held to the scriptures thinking they had life. But the truth is they were producing death in themselves. They thought they were alive, but they were dead. That's where the opportunity of sin really came in. Verse 11, for sin taking an opportunity through the commandment deceived me. And though it killed me, and through it killed me, so then the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. It deceived him. To the biggest degree of deception that the law gives is the deception of self-righteousness. That we can attain the law without the Spirit of God. That we can attain to the law to any degree at all. We can't even attain it, not even with the Spirit of God. When we're in the Spirit of God, we come under a new law, a law of grace, something different. Therefore, he says in verse 13, Therefore did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be. Rather it was sin in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good, so that through the commandment sin would become utterly sinful. In essence, what he's saying is the law is good. I agree with the law. And the fact that we agree with the law is this. Does anybody in here desire to be an adulterer? Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you desire to be faithful, not an adulterer. You agree with the law because the law says we should not commit adultery. We agree that the law is good. We agree with it. So he says that, Therefore did that which is good become a cause of death for me? He says, No, may it never be. Rather it was sin in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good. The law is good. So that through the commandment, sin would become utterly sinful. What the commandment does is show us the effect of sin. What the command does is show us the result of sin. The law itself doesn't produce sin. The law itself doesn't produce death. Sin comes through the law, but the law itself isn't sin. And when sin comes through the law, death comes through sin. Does that make sense? Paul's a little confusing in all this. He like jumps back and forth and I would imagine there was an easier way to say all this, but this is what he chose. This is how the Spirit of God led him to say this. But the law is spiritual and the law is good. Listen to what Adam Clark, the commentator, says about this. I like what he had to say. The law is not to be considered as a system of external rites and ceremonies, nor even as a rule of moral action. It is a spiritual system. 
It reaches to the most hidden purposes, thoughts, dispositions, and desires of the heart and soul. And it reproves and condemns everything without hope of reprieve or pardon that is contrary to eternal truth and rectitude. It's spiritual. And it really is. When you look at the law, it reveals what's within, what's going on inside of us. And that is the purpose of the law. Verse 14, it says, Now we know that the law is spiritual, what he just said. But I am flesh, sold into bondage of sin. Now I'm going to read verses 15 through 23 as a whole. And then I'm going to go back and just break it up. And we're, we're almost done, so don't. I'm not going to keep you guys too long. But unless anybody's really got to go, the door's there. But it's worth staying. Verse 15, I'm going to read 15 through 23. For what I am doing I do not understand, for I am not practicing what I would like to do. But I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. For if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me a man, or making me a, a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, I messed up and I read that verse. But Paul, do you see how his, his words can sound a bit confusing? It just goes back and forth and it's this big altercation of words. And he's making one really big point. I want to do good but I keep doing bad. Amen! We can all identify with that, and if you can't, then you're better off than I am, because this is my life's story. I want to do good. We agree with the law that the law is good. We aim to do what's right, to do what's pleasing before God, because in our mind, we've been renewed. But our body of flesh is still present and under subjugation to the law and sin and death. And though we want to do right here, when it comes to the work of our hands, we often do wrong. That's the idea behind the good that I want to do, I don't. And the good and the wrong that I don't want to do, I keep doing. Can anybody feel that? And I hate to break the bad news, it never ends. And if somebody gets you to think it ends, well, that's pride. And they're deeper than probably you could ever go. They're actually so deep they're deceived. That's a scary place to be. We are sinners. We sin because we are sinners. Because this body of flesh is alive. This body of flesh is not free from the law yet. 1 Corinthians 15, when he's talking about the physical, re physical resurrection, when you die, your body physically becomes free of sin. And one day your resurrected new body will be sinless. When we died to Christ in the mind, our mind became freed. And our mind was freed from sin and death. And we no longer live in the oldness of the ways here, but the flesh still produces flesh. Now, yes, we can do good works with our hands. We are to do good works. But inevitably, the old man will come out. It's, I hate I hate to say it. I wish I could just get up here and preach and be like, oh, you'll never sin again. And I'm just lying to you if I say that. That's contrary to everything Paul just said. We are sinners. It's not does not give us occasion to sin. But just realize that when you sin, when you fall short, you're human. Get back up. Get right with God once again. When you sin, it doesn't remove you from salvation. Realize that. When we operate in sin, you are not removed from salvation. But when we operate in sin, we are removed from fellowship with God. Anybody in here ever had a fight with your spouse? You still married afterwards? You should be. I mean, in our culture, not, not always, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, typically after a fight, you're hurt, you're angry, you yelled at each other, whatever you said, you're still married. But you've now severed the fellowship between you. And the way you reunite that fellowship is through forgiveness. So as Christians, when we operate in flesh like the stupid those we are, what we do is we get right with God and reunite the fellowship. Don't stay separated. You'll still be saved because you're not saved by your works. You're saved by faith through grace, by grace through faith. You're not saved by what you've done or you, you believe Jesus. That's what makes you saved. That's the 
biblical text. So if you've messed up, get right. Reunite the fellowship. Start hanging around with other believers. That's like the best thing you can do for your walk with God. Get in the Word, get in prayer, get around believers. Don't go hide off in a corner somewhere. Corner somewhere. Don't stop reading God's Word. Don't stop praying. But I'm here to tell you, you have to do all three if you want to flourish. If you want to have a weak walk, just do one or two of them. I promise you, if I dare anybody in here to breathe, drink water, but don't eat for the rest of your life. The rest of your life is going to come pretty quick. you got about 40-some days before you legitimately die, maybe sooner depending on your body and your, nourishment, and your level of nourishment. I dare anybody in here to eat, breathe, just don't drink. Your chances just got slimmer. Without hydration, you got about, I think it's seven days without hydration, and then you, 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 you collapse into like a coma. You, your blood turns like sludgy and you can die. I dare somebody in here to go... Eat, drink, just don't breathe. Your chances just got even slimmer. You got about, I mean, if you're like that David Blaine dude, you got a few hours, you know? But if you're normal like the rest of us, you got only got, what is it? How long does it take to, to pass out from not breathing? Three minutes? After like five minutes, you start suffering brain damage. After like seven minutes, it's irreparable brain damage. And then after like, I think, eight minutes or something, like you're dead. Like you're just dead. I, really, after a good five minutes, you're dead. Let's just be real. The word of God is called food in the scriptures. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. When we pray, it's like hydration to our soul. Jesus talks about a spring of, of living waters coming up from within. It's like the spirit of God. When we pray, we, we rehydrate that spirit in us. And when we fellowship, you guys, it's like oxygen to the soul, to the body. It's a... Have you ever just been out of fellowship and then you fellowship and afterwards you're like, I needed that. I've, I've even used this word. That was like a breath of fresh air. We can't live physically without those three elements. And spiritually, we cannot live without those three elements either. We need the word, we need prayer, and we need fellowship. And if you want to die as a Christian, just get out of any one of them. You go down really quickly. Now, you might fool us here or fool the people out there, but you don't fool you. I don't fool me. I know when I'm out of fellowship and I know how I get when I'm out of fellowship or when I'm out of God's word or when I'm out of prayer with him. Anyways, I don't know why I'm saying all that, but I'm saying all that. <laughs> that was for somebody because that was not here. But, verse 16, but if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good because we want to do these things, confessing that it is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. That is not a cop-out. That is not him saying, well, it's sin. You know, I, I couldn't control myself. No, he's just relating a very real spiritual principle. That I want to do good, but there is a real nature of sin in me that comes out. Verse 18, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I'm going... But if I'm doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find the principle then that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. This can be said like this, and I said this a couple weeks ago. Two natures beat within my chest. One is cursed, one is blessed. One I love, one I hate. The one I feed will dominate. That is the principle that Paul is setting forward here. There's two natures in us. The mind has been renewed, new nature. The body has not been yet renewed. Now, yes, we talked about last week, if we correct the mind, often our actions follow, and they do. But even in our actions, we have mess-ups. Because we want to do good and we fail at doing good because we are fleshly beings. Now, Paul says this here in verse 24, and this touched my soul. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free? from the body of this death. That hits me like deep. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? I find this to be so encouraging. If you guys were here Wednesday night, we talked about the faults of the, the faithful fathers of our faith. How they have had so many faults that are recorded for us in scripture. And I cling to those faults, not because I want them, because it, it's a good reminder that we're human. And that none of us 
are perfect and none of us are going to be perfect. Too many of us set these unrealistic standards in and on our lives. And by doing so, we set ourselves up to fail before we even start. You're a failure. I'm a failure. It's what it is. Like I tell people what I'm doing, I don't know what I'm doing. I've never started a church. I started a church in Santa Fe. I mean, but I, this is still new to me. I'm new at this. So if I stub your toe, give me some grace. Let me know. I'll apologize by all means. I have no clue what I'm doing. I'm just, I, when people come at me like, what do we do? <laughs> I know about as much as you, bro. I don't. What do you think we should do? I don't know. Call an expert. <laughs> I don't know. Let's go talk to someone. I don't know. I mean, I got some ideas, but pff, I don't know what works or doesn't work. I'm winging this. Wretched man that I am, I'm going to fail and have many blunders and faults. Do not look at me as something more than I really am. A wretched man that is a sinner, saved by the grace of God, doing the work and will of God to the best of my ability that is going to let you down at some point or another. And when I let you down, don't hold that against me. Come let me know you let me down, Walter. And I will say, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do that. You didn't say hi to me. My bad. I had like four other people on my shoulder. You didn't do this for me. Did you ask for that? No, well, I'm, my bad. Man. Just let me know. I, I don't, I'm, I'm one man and that's all I am. And I can't do it all. And I'm going to fail you guys. Do not look at me like I'm something more than I am. I think it's one of the detriments of the Western church. When you look at the pastor as some superstar, sinless man, and a lot of pastors, I, they might not think they are, but they act like they're that. They're like they're above the people. I'm just like you guys. I have the same types of struggles you guys have. I mean, I fought with my wife before service. I was see outside arguing with her because I told her maybe we should take Ezekiel home because he was coughing, so she said I'm taking him home. And I was like, well, don't go. Well, she said, you said take him home. And I was like, well, that's an argument right there. I, I lived out the text this morning and it felt so stupid. Text her before service apologizing. Like, I'm so sorry. Like, I lived out the text. I didn't want to do that and then I went and did it anyway like an idiot. That was a wretched man that I'm, who will deliver me from this body of death? <laughs> you know, like, I'm just like you guys. My gift is just different. And your gifts are different than mine. I can't do a lot of the things you guys can do. I, mean, I can do them, but not as good because it's my ability but when God is giving you a gift, that's beyond your ability. That is something God has given you. Nothing compares to that. Who will set us free from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's that exhortation after that slap in the face. And I believe that is a slingshot into what we're going to see next week. But then he finishes it up saying, So then, on one hand, I myself with my mind in serving the law of God, but on the other hand, with my flesh, the law of sin. As Christians, we are caught between two worlds. And it is not an easy place to live. But this is where we are at. And we maintain forward because the mind is the more important thing that needed to be purified. The mind is, we talked about it last week, the mind is the holy of holies where God dwells. The mind is the all in all. This is what we really are. This is the heart. This is what and who we really are is here. The body is just the body. This is dying, fleeting. This, though... This was the more important thing. And this is what God died to scrub clean, to renew. This is what God desires from you and I is this right here. Now our flesh will always come in because we're still alive. But there's coming a day when these physical bodies will pass. And they will resurrect to new life. And our new bodies will correspond with our new mind. And we will be sinless. And we will no longer be bound by sin and death. Now I look forward to that day. It's a hard thing for me to imagine because we're so corrupted. But God said it will be so and it will. That being said, Father, we thank you for being God. Thank you for this beautiful crowd of people here this morning. Would you bless each and every one of them? Uphold them with your righteous right hand, Lord. Cause your face to shine on each of them. For those who are online, bless them, Lord. Go before each of us throughout the rest of this week, this upcoming week. And would you just direct our paths, our ways. Would you continue to renew our minds that we would be made more like you, Lord. That we would love you and serve you with our heart, mind, soul, and strength. All that we are would be yours, Lord. I pray that you would continue to culminate the gifts of the people in this body, that you would encourage the people who have desires to do your will, Lord, that they would rise to the occasion, no matter what it is, Lord, whether it's a greeting, a sitting, a worship, a rap, whether it's a study, a teaching, Lord, your will be done, Lord. 
We pray that this would be a place where your body uses its gifts to edify the body. I thank you for these people, Lord. We love you and praise you for who you are in Jesus' name. Amen.